Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, and I'm Mia Friedman. Lisa Messenger forgot to have a baby. That's how she tells it. And she's sort of joking, but also she's not. Because like so many women who try so hard not to get pregnant in their 20s, by the time she met the right guy and was ready in her early 40s, her body refused to play ball. And Lisa was shocked because she was used to succeeding when she set herself a goal. As an entrepreneur who's had a long and successful career running several publishing businesses and travelling Australia as a motivational speaker, the goal that Lisa had now set was motherhood. And it wasn't working. So over the next eight years, she would have 16 rounds of IVF and spend more than $500,000 trying to have a baby. But it wasn't until Lisa's friend, Sarah Meganson, offered to help that she even had a chance. And now, Lisa's baby is due in August. Some women get pregnant accidentally, and others have to move heaven and earth before they can hold a baby in their arms. This is one of those stories. And I invited Lisa to join me on No Filter to tell me exactly how it happened. Lisa, when you were younger, did you imagine having children at a certain time in your life? Did you even imagine that you'd definitely be a mother? I did. And it's kind of interesting because this year I've had my own business for 22 years. You can relate to this. And I was married like a long, long time ago when I was like, 30. And I imagine then, this is like, it feels like a lifetime ago, that we would have children then because everyone else was having children mm. then. And then that kind of didn't work out. And then I really got kind of stuck into my career and I loved it. And I just, I mean, it sounds so naive and so stupid, really. I just was so busy, you know, achieving and thought my definition of success was doing more and being more and achieving more. And that's certainly changed and I've reprioritized now. But yeah, I think I just kind of then forgot about having children. And by the time I decided that I really wanted children, which was eight years ago, you know, there were a whole lot of issues which we can delve deep into. (laughs) Mm. I want to ask about that idea of it's like that cartoon of, oops, I forgot to have Mm. children. I mean, you don't forget to have children, but did you actually just think that it would be an option in the future that would always be available to you when you were ready? Yeah, I think for someone who prides myself on not being particularly smart but being street smart, in hindsight, I'm like, that was so naive, really. I think, you know, you're told throughout your 20s, be careful, you you can get pregnant, you know, and as I got older and more educated around it, I realize now having been through eight years and 18 rounds of IVF that actually there's a very small window (laughs) where you can actually get pregnant. And so I think I just had this thing in a way, I'm invincible, you know, I can make this happen. It will be there when I'm ready. And by the time I actually got smart and wise to, I really should do something about this. And there's a whole lot of factors that play into it you know, being single or being in dysfunctional relationships or, you know, career or all sorts of things. But then there were certain things where I did get pregnant with my previous partner eight years ago. I then had a miscarriage, but that was kind of the light for me that would switched on and was like, oh, I got that mothering instinct. I was like, I really want to do this. And that started a trajectory of a whole lot of different ways of trying. Was that an accidental pregnancy, if you don't mind me asking, when you had the miscarriage or were you trying to have a baby? No, well, we were engaged and it was just like the next natural thing. And then I had a miscarriage and then we broke up. And then Mm. that same year I went to Bali, spent my birthday in the Jodi O'Shea orphanage, spent three days lying next to this eight-month-old baby, Gracie, tried to adopt her the following year. I Because then by then I was like the light switched on and this is a precursory warning to other people, like you really try and be conscious about thinking into it and feeling into it because it was as it turns out, you know, too late for me for a variety of reasons. But yeah, so then miscarriage tried to adopt. And then the following year, 
I was single, but I was like, I am going to do this. And so I went through two rounds of IVF with donor sperm. So I've walked many paths. <laughs> and so, yeah, then I was kind of like, I'm going to do this. And, you know, being an A-type overachieving personality where in business I pride myself on being a problem solver I was like right here's a challenge let's solve this turns out not so easy to solve when you met your now fiance or partner he calls himself my husband it's not true we've been together six and a half years we've been engaged for three and a half yeah so yes when you met him you would have been already in your 40s did you guys talk about having a baby straight away Yeah. And that was really interesting, right? Because I'd already just been through two rounds of IVF solo. I met someone. It was a pretty early conversation. In fact, he brought it up and said, do you want to have children? And I was like, yeah, I do. I mean, I think it was on like our second date. And Then I was very honest about, you know, where I'd been, which brings up all sorts of emotions, comes, you know, a waiting period because it's like, well, I'm just going to like jump into bed with you and go, yay, let's go for it. So it was six months or so before we were like, okay, let's actually try and have children. That's quite early. I mean, I'm speaking as someone who did accidentally get pregnant six months after meeting (laughs) my partner, but Six months, I guess the clock was obviously ticking. Was he the same age as you and had he had children before? He's 10 years younger than me, go me. And with that comes a whole lot of potential emotional responsibility because when we met, he said to me, can you still have children? Oh, that's confronting, was it? Yeah, but I had every test under the sun. So I confidently, you know, being I'm very much on the positivity, optimistic side of Mm. things, always glass full, not even half full. I mean, I just believe that anything is possible. So I was like, yeah, of course, because I had been through so many tests, you know, having undergone two rounds of IVF already. So as we started going into the journey, I did feel often very guilty. And when I was having meltdowns, I would say, just go and find someone younger who actually is in working order and can give you a child. And to his credit, not once ever, ever, ever amongst a multitude of my meltdowns has he ever wavered. Like he has always said, no, you are the person I want to be with. We will find a way. And he's also been very resolute in I want to have a child, which probably is something that kept me going because trust me, there are a number of times where I just wanted to give up. Anything around fertility is really confronting in that same way that you say because even if you don't realize you believe it when you discover that it's hard for you to have children or that you can't conceive or or maintain a pregnancy speaking personally I felt I failed I failed as a woman here's what I was put on earth to do I can't manage it I felt worthless yeah but also so many lessons through this you know like so much in life that we believe we can control or you know there is a a Mm. solution to because I'm a a problem solver I'm someone who finds Mm. solutions to pretty much everything and eventually we have and we'll get to that but you know when you're in it and you're like I am broken this is not working you know I worked out I've injected myself about 480 times At one point, I was taking 90 tablets a day through a Chinese medicine person. Like that sounds excessive, but it's one of those ones where there's 50 little bullet type things that you Mm. take down at once. I was also doing acupuncture three times a week, you know, like literally, you know, doing poo samples and sending them to America. (laughs) Like you name it, we did it and still nothing was working. And that's like excruciatingly painful because whatever you throw at it and however much we were trying to do to kind of, you know, come at it from every angle, it just wasn't working. I had someone close to me who went through this and I remember you get trapped in this almost magical thinking that I watched with her where it's, I found this doctor that thinks it could be this and I found this and I'm trying this and I'm sending this and I'm trying this medicine and this natural practitioner in the acupuncture. And then at a certain point, I just said to her, babe, what if your eggs are just too old? What if you're just too old? Yeah. Because I could hear the clock ticking and I'm like, 
you got to have to think of plan B and C and D because plan A is not an option. Like it's not just that you haven't found the right doctor. It's that you are in your mid to late 40s and it's too late for it to happen that way that you really want it to happen. Did anyone say that to you ever? No. So this is a fascinating thing and this is where the the cynicism in me kicks in and a lot actually in hindsight is that, you know, we run businesses so there is a commercial side to things and so there were many points I think particularly in hindsight where, and this is being very verbose about it, I'm sure sometimes when the clinic you know, when it didn't work, they were probably running their hands, you know, together going, oh, another 12 grand. Okay, here we go. <laughs> you know, like, so, th- I mean, that's being, you know, very, very cynical, but it is unfortunately in my experience over the past eight years, largely unregulated. There's a lot of cowboys out there. There's a lot of people selling hope, preying on you when you're at your most vulnerable. Mm. And being the eternal optimist and always, you know, being positive, I think you kind of get to a point where you're like, okay, well, here's something else I'll try and here's something else I'll try. Even still, Mia, I have five embryos in the freezer and even now I go, oh, maybe I'll just pop one in. Like I'm still there, right? (laughs) And it is extraordinary what you go through emotionally, physically and financially because there's so many things that play into it and we can talk about, you know, any and all of that. How much do you think you've spent over the last eight years? a lot and also I don't say it lightly when I know that we're in a very privileged and fortunate position that we're able to do so and this is another reason that you know we're sharing our story publicly is to try and help other people I don't have the answers but I've certainly trodden a lot of paths Mm. and even though you know I have a relatively successful business that's been going for 22 years and my partner has a also a very successful business. We still had to sell our home last year to do this. So definitely north of half a million dollars already, you know. Mm. And and that is excruciating in many ways. But Stephen said to me, if the result that we want is a baby, and that is our greatest priority on the planet at this time, then it actually doesn't matter if we spend one dollar or a million dollars. Like and so that was very sobering and grounding for me because I was like, okay, I don't give a flying fuck about material things anymore. Like what we want is we want a child and that is kind of where we got to. But you know, it was and has been excruciatingly painful just all of the things that we've been through from an emotional perspective, physical and financial. Did you really do IVF 18 times? I did it 16 times, Sarah. I've done it twice. And so do you think that you should have been allowed to do it 16 times? I mean, I don't know who would have allowed or not allowed you, but clearly, I don't know, maybe people do it 16 times and it works on the 17th time. Or do you now look at that and say someone should have intervened earlier? I think... Someone should have intervened earlier and probably, again, it comes down to an education piece because at certain times throughout, things became so obvious that it was like, oh, we can try that, we haven't done that. And the clinic that we used, they would literally be like, oh, no, everything's fine. And every time we would have a debriefing conversation Mm -hmm. and the head of the clinic, you know, both of us being entrepreneurs and problem solvers would be like, but what else can we do? Oh, no, it's just a numbers game. Our <sighs> Lisa's eggs still great. Yeah, yeah, they're great. We're collecting, you know, five to 12 eggs every time. Yeah, they're all fine. We've tested everything. There's no problems. But they couldn't have been fine, not at your age. So were they lying to you? I don't know. And I'm not going to go there because we still have five yeah, in the Yeah, I hear place. you. <laughs> I hear you. Destroying our little babies. Lisa, what would happen? Like they'd get the eggs. They'd fertilize the eggs, they'd put them in you and then you wouldn't be able to hold the pregnancy or what would happen? So I haven't held any of the pregnancies. There was one, maybe it was about around eight or something, where it, which is just horrible, it it was almost like it was that fine line of, you know, is it, are you pregnant or not? Mm. So it was awful. I was doing speaking gigs around Australia at the time because real life and I had to do that Mm. and Stephen was 
waiting at the airport in Sydney with big balloons and like, here we go. And then, I mean, that one didn't even last a day. So I've had 16 phone calls after two week incubation periods of, oh, not this time. So it's been a lot. And you know, that has knock on effects because I'm the great oversharer, although I never ever shared any of this publicly until I think around 16 or 15. But you know, I would ring my mom every single time and be like, not Mm. this time. I mean, for a 79 year old woman that she now is like, that's a lot, you know, when your daughter is ringing every time being like, not this time, mom. Yeah. Yeah. So in hindsight, and knowing what I know now, and Sarah and I can get onto our story. Yeah, I would have pulled up stumps a lot earlier, I think. Did anyone say to you, you should try donor eggs or you should try getting a surrogate? Was that said to you at any point along that way of 16 IVF attempts? Not by the fertility clinic that we were using, not once. And that is very disappointing in hindsight. However, I did have an extraordinary woman along the way where I was doing a procedure outside of that clinic and she said to me oh I see people all the time at your age using donor eggs and they have so much success so that was said to me then and the surrogacy thing not at all other than Sally Obermita who is a mutual friend of ours she had used a surrogate in the US and so I had a great chat with Sal and that's when that first came up and which we'll get to Sarah had said five years prior to this if you ever want a surrogate Coming up after the break, Lisa surrogate Sarah tells us about the moment she told her husband she was having a friend's baby. Sarah, how long have you and Lisa known each other? How did you meet? We met 12 and a half years ago and we met through work. So, you know, Lisa runs a publishing company and I'm a writer and we met on a project and hilariously when we look back at our very first meeting my daughter was five months old and I had called Lisa's office the morning of the meeting it was the very first time I was meeting her to work on a project and I called and said I'm so sorry I have to reschedule my babysitter's fallen through so I'm gonna have to come another time and I could hear Lisa in the background like talking to her staff and she's like oh don't be silly just bring the baby in and so I did the very first time I ever met Lisa I had my like little tiny baby with me and now that we think about that story it's so hilarious that our first ever meeting completely professional like but with a baby there and now to end up 12 almost 13 years later in this situation is just like it's like one of those little universe uh signals <laughs> that we were going to end up here did you know she was going through IVF I did so we've worked professionally that whole time but we've been friends as well and so I did but interestingly like not in the trenches with Lisa like it wasn't like I was one of the people Lisa was calling after a two-week wait saying Mm. it didn't happen, which I Mm. think is really interesting for us because we've just always had this very close relationship but also we could kind of go six months without talking and then when we get back together we're like fish underwater and da-da-da-da, we're like Mm. straight back to where we were, which meant that when I caught up with her for a coffee five years ago and catching up, how's it going, how's the IVF? Yeah, just started, not great, but we'll see how we go and very offhandedly, not that offhandedly because I was serious, but I was like, if you end up needing a surrogate, I'm here for you. What made you say that? So it's so bizarre. Fertility for me and my husband was ridiculously easy. We decided we were ready for kids and then we were pregnant and that happened three times. So I had such an easy journey, but I saw so many people around me struggle and I was always really struck by the unfairness of it and So weirdly, like in a slight parallel, my dad had cancer and I remember when he was in the thick of that and so many people would give us unwanted (laughs) advice like, have you tried the apricot kernels? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? All of these snake oil, you know, and people are well-meaning, but the answer is yes, we've tried everything. And I saw that happening with my friends who had fertility issues. Have you tried this? Just relax, all of that stuff. And I really quickly (laughs) learned to just be there like just listen don't give advice because I'm not in a position to give advice it happened for me so I would just kind of be there and listen Mm. but when I was um pregnant with my son Jesse he's now seven and a half I can remember talking to my husband saying I think I could be a surrogate for someone like I've got him in my tummy moving I can feel him and I think if this was not my baby I think I would be okay to give birth and you know everyone talks about that like hand the baby over moment (laughs) I was like I'm pretty sure I could do it so 
it was a discussion I'd had with my husband before over time, not with anyone specific in mind. Like my eldest sister never had kids and we'd kind of talked about and hers was just she didn't meet the right guy or whatever. And we'd talked about my sisters, like if they ever needed someone, not in a serious way. So it was at the back of my mind. I had never offered to be a surrogate to anyone other than Lisa. So you're clearly someone who really enjoys being pregnant. I do. I do. I think it's miraculous. I just, like, I think it's ridiculous. He's kicking my ribs right now. And I'm like, I just think this whole thing is a miracle (laughs) that this tiny little cell got injected into me seven months ago. And now we're close to having a baby. Like it's incredible. I do get really sick in pregnancy, which I just kind of, it's like, that's okay. I'm happy to do the first trimester and vomit a lot. When we actually seriously started talking about it, any objection that came up or like thought of, oh, what if I'm going to be really tired? What if I have to do this? What if I don't have energy for my kids? Da, da, da. All of that just paled in comparison to the, oh, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> I'm allowed to because I'm pregnant or hormonal. <laughs> but it all just completely paled in comparison to what the outcome is. Sorry, I'm such a crier anyway. I have pregnancy hormones and I'm gone. But having seen Lisa go on this journey. Like I said, I wasn't in the trenches with her, but we were still very much in touch and like, how's it going? Another round of IVF didn't work, you know, talking about it all. So to have like witnessed the tenacity and the resilience to just keep going. By the time we had that conversation, I think it had been six years, six and a bit years. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And I was like, my uterus works. If you want it, let's try. And we did. And here we are. And Lisa, how do you go from that kind of offhand something that someone says to actually making it happen? Like how did you receive that offer at the time? At the time, and I think this is really important, it was just like, oh, thank you. Wow, amazing, but no thank you. Like I think a lot of people say to us, oh, wow, surrogate, when did you decide? Like it was just a fleeting decision. It's not. It's like anything in life. And this is where Sarah and I now, you know, really encourage people, look for signs, look for, you know, be vulnerable, ask for things, whatever. You never know when it's going to come back, you know. At the time, five years ago, I was like, wow, beautiful. Oh, I couldn't even. You're sort of recoiling when you say that. Is that because it's like it feels very intimate? This is like your partner's sperm and your egg, putting it into someone else's body. Like is that what you kind no, of. Uh... it wasn't that. It was that. I think emotionally you go through stages. So when I met Stephen, he was very much like, we will have a child naturally. So then it was like big emotional conversations to even get to let's do IVF. So then there were several other things that we needed to go through. Let's do this. So at the time it was inconceivable. Like I mentioned to him a couple of times surrogacy and he was just like, no, 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 no. What even is that? Like, so it takes a lot of, conversation communication openness going through a lot of things emotionally because you go from of course we'll carry a baby to this now I have to say being in it now I'm gonna cry Sarah and I are just so freaking close like it's insane how in sync we are it is like she is like my best friend on the planet right now like it is I cannot imagine in another universe bringing a child into the world without Sarah now like it is the most beautiful incredible 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 thing it has brought so much joy and every day is just like off the charts unbelievable and so that is the greatest gift on the planet to come out of this but five years ago it wasn't even a thought you know yeah I understand what you're saying it's like at each stage of infertility you have to accept the disappointment of okay, so natural's not going to happen. Okay, so IVF is not going to happen. Like you have to let go of that thing and close a door on it before you can be open to the idea of the next level of intervention. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. And whatever it is, societal norms, noise that we've heard, preconditioning our whole lives, you just go, well, of course I'm going to carry my own baby. Of course I don't need to do it. And so I think I warmed up to way earlier than Stephen and I was like, oh, there's this friend of mine, Sarah, and he was just like, what, what, what? So it took a long time and what actually ended up happening was 
Last March, we were back in Byron for a bit and there was the floods and for some reason I thrive most in a crisis. And so I jumped in and started setting up evacuation centres and like doing a lot in the Northern Rivers area. And unbeknownst to me, Sarah's hubby David is a radio host on the Gold Coast and his co-host had said, oh, you need to interview Lisa, she's doing all this flood work. And so I did an interview with him, still not knowing he was Sarah's hubby. Sarah texted me after and was like, oh, my gosh, you were just on the radio with my hubby. How's the IVF going? And it's extraordinary. This is on text. And I was like, not great, still want to be a surrogate. So that's March 2022. And we've kind of unpacked that a lot. And we're like, why was I suddenly ready? And I think the thing is I was literally dealing with people in life and death situations, you know, saving people from houses and cats from roofs and setting up evacuation centres. So when she asked me that and I was just like, I'm ready. And she texted me back being like, okay, you know, great, let's try this or whatever. And then I was like, okay, let me just deal with the floods and I'll come back to you in two days. (laughs) And so that's kind of where it really started. Sarah, from your point of view, was your husband already on board? He wasn't on board, but he was aware. So after that conversation, he came home from work that day and I was like, oh, you interviewed Lise today. Because I had told him years ago when I'd had coffee with Lise, I was like, by the way, I offered to be Lise's surrogate this week. Ha ha ha. He was <laughs> like, did you really? I'm like, yeah, but you know, it's not going to happen. She's doing IVF, whatever. So I said, oh, by the way, they are actually looking for a surrogate. And he was like, oh, okay. The slight complicating factor here is that I had finished having kids. I got really bad abdominal hernias in my childbirth. And so four years ago, I had surgery to like repair my midsection and put a mesh thing in there because my doctor is like, you finished having kids, right? Yeah, I'm not going to have any more. And he's like, great, we'll do this surgery. So that was his (laughs) first thing. He was like, I thought you couldn't be pregnant again. You've got like a stomach full of mesh holding you together. And I was like, yeah, yep, there's that. (laughs) <laughs> and he was like, okay, well. Had you not remembered that when you made the offer? Well, when I made the offer five years ago, I hadn't <laughs> had the surgery. Uh. It never came up again for a couple of years. So I went and got the surgery and thought, you know, life goes on. And so then I went, I should really call my surgeon before we get any further down this path. I better make sure that I am actually physically capable of doing this. So I remember him saying straight away, it's not a no but it's a, can we explore? (laughs) And so I straight away called my surgeon and he was so lovely and hilarious. And he was like, I thought we were done with babies. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. But I kind of would love to have a baby for my friend. (laughs) And he was like, okay, cool. So he said, look, I actually don't know because most of my patients like have this surgery and then stop. (laughs) So he said, I'm going to go talk to a few other like professors and, you know, whatever, and get some information. Call me back in a week. And then I had that feeling for that week of like holy crap I hope I just haven't given Lisa and Stephen false hope and said I'll do this Mm -hmm. and then I come back and find out I can't but I called back in a week and he said look yep the research is you know pretty slim but he said definitely don't have twins and pray that it's a small baby (laughs) but he's like basically the mesh is there it might tear there might be complications but it might be okay. He's like, overall, look, you're going to be fine. And he said, you'll get pregnant, you'll have the baby, there might be complications, and we'll just have to deal with that afterwards. We might have to put you back together again. That's a big deal. It's quite a lot. Sarah. <laughs> like, if you're not gathering already, the fact that Sarah actually said, oh, firstly, I'll carry your baby as a surrogate. Oh, by the way, you know, I might have to have operations and get put back together <laughs> at the end. And also, she just mentioned for the first trimester, like, she was vomiting probably four to 12 times every day. And every time I'd be like, I'm so sorry, I'll stick my fingers yeah. down my throat. I'm going to go down in solidarity. And she was like, no, it's amazing. It means it's working. Like I would take her to lunch and she'd be like, oh, sorry, just go to the bathroom. Like she is the most angelic person on the entire planet. <laughs> What's that like, Lisa, watching your pregnancy happening outside your body? Is that quite surreal? So. It's so weird. I feel so connected to Sarah that I feel like I'm also carrying, it's like almost unexplainable. And also I know that, I mean, we talk probably 20 times a day on every channel possible and like we see each other three times a week and we're very in sync. This week we both went, because we have any excuse for a girly staycation, and this week we went 
to the Langham Hotel on the Gold Coast for Saturday and we had beautiful high tea and then we had massages and then we had a beautiful dinner and we just didn't stop talking for 11 hours straight and we talked about everything under the sun and a lot of it then unfortunately played out in real time so we were sharing a two-bedroom room and it just after midnight Sarah oh come they were talking about this but it's important (laughs) came into my room and was like I'm not feeling good at all. So this is, to put it in perspective, four days ago, five days ago, and I was like, oh, my God, what's going on? Do you want me to keep telling the story? I don't remember <laughs> a lot of it. You're better to, to share. So Sarah came in, lay on my bed. I was like, what the hell? Like we just had the most beautiful day. Mm. Everything was amazing. She's like, call Dr. Drew, who's our obstetrician. I called him. Then she's like, I'm going to vomit. She projectile vomited across my entire bed. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And then I called the ambulance. And the ambulance is like, put on speaker, is this labor? And they literally said to me (laughs) four nights ago, can you see a head or legs or arms? So I'm like, (laughs) everything says legs. I'm like, I don't think so. I was in excruciating pain, but I knew it wasn't labor. (laughs) It was quite an intimate moment. And the funny thing is our dads both passed away within three months of each other to the day. And so during the day on Sunday, we were talking about, oh, when we go into hospital, remember our dads, how they'd both be like flapping around in hospital and you'd see their asses hanging out of the back of, ha, ha, ha. The next thing I'm like in Sarah's legs and then like it was all on for young and old. So it was a very scary, horrible moment. Sarah, as you've probably gathered, her threshold for pain is like she just goes through anything and while she was on the bed before the ambulance got there I'm like where are you what's your pain at she's like it's an eight out of ten it (gasps) went to an 11 out of ten and we were both like what the fuck is going on Sarah did it feel like labor no but it was excruciating it was coming out of my kidneys it was like labor out of my kidneys it was cramping and I was really worried because we were 28 weeks and I was really worried that I was going to go into early labor because it was cramping but all on one side I didn't think it was labour and we called our obstetrician and he said, because I've done it three times before, he's like, does it feel like you're mm. in labour? And I said, no, it doesn't, but it, it feels worse. It was oh, so much what worse. What was it? Life. Was it a kidney stone? No, the most horrific bladder and kidney infection. It was an undiagnosed <gasps> UTI that went to my bladder and then went to my kidney. And I had no symptoms of it, like absolutely nothing. So by the time I felt it, it was like very well entrenched in my body. Oh, wow. Yeah. That must have been so scary for both of you. It was crazy too because I was so out of it with pain and everything is going through our minds. I'm like, do I have a kidney stone? Am I about to deliver this baby? Are we about to have surgery? Like all these different things. But I kept saying, like, I can feel him moving. He's kicking me. Like I just kept remembering to tell Lisa, like, the baby's okay. He's okay. He's okay. I'm not, (laughs) but he is okay. I was going to ask about when your husbands first met. Was that the world's weirdest double date? <laughs> they actually love each other now. They, they've yeah, got a, they've having, got a great friendship now. They've got but a great friendship. Weird. No, I think they're both pranksters and they both love a good joke. So, like, it's so ridiculous. Like last night, Stephen just called David, I know, out of the blue, and he's like, mate, I'm off dishwasher duty. There's all these running jokes because Stephen cannot stack the dishwasher properly. Anyway, <laughs> they both think it's hysterical and now they just call each other all the time. So, it's actually quite beautiful because I think at the start that was probably a bit strange. Like Sarah and I immediately were like really close and it's just deepened every single day. And now the boys are like, I feel like they're super close. Yeah. The first meeting for them though was therapy. Like it was a psychology session. Oh, yeah, therapy. I was going to ask you because um, surrogacy is very easy overseas. It's just a bit of a pay for play situation, really. It's just an open market. But here, you're not allowed to pay. What do you have to do before you're allowed to be a surrogate? There's a lot of therapy. Well, not I wouldn't say a lot of therapy, but there was an extensive therapy session before anything got going. Before we were allowed to even look at anything medical, we had to have this like three hour session with me and Lisa and Stephen and my husband David like separately and together 
and then this mm-hmm. really intense psychiatric assessment. Which you can't cheat on because it's one of those no. ones that asks you the same, the same thing question 20, 20 times. times in different ways, <laughs> which was, a, I think, obviously a really great place to start because it's just making sure that all four of us are up for this because it needed the endorsement of the four of us really to go forward. Sarah, what kinds of things would they ask you in this therapy session? Things for me were like, have you ever offered anyone else a surrogacy? Is this like, what's your motivation for doing it? How do you think it's going to impact your kids? Which I have a really positive view on that. Like my kids are seven, nine and 12. And I just think this whole experience for them has been expansive because they're adorable. The questions they come up with, like my son is seven. And at first he was like, I was five weeks pregnant he was like mum have you had that baby for your friend yet I was like no little way to go (laughs) we've got a bit more education to do here (laughs) Um, that's so adorable it's been such a sweet journey with them and I just think amazing for them to see families come in so many different shapes and sizes and my son he's really into the who are they to us so like are they family like is that going to be my cousin and I've we've said yeah it's chosen cousin like it's not like a blood relation, mm. but they're chosen family. So it's going to be your cousin. He's going to be in your life forever. And you know, it's been a really amazing experience for them. But I think a lot of the questions were around all that kind of stuff. How's it going to impact your whole family? Even like, how do you think your mum's going to feel about you giving birth to a baby that's not her grandchild? And, you know, really, I think really important and valid questions. And then we had lots of questions we had to go through, which were for me, having had babies, they weren't surprising, but they were like, oh, these are hard. Like what if we get pregnant and do testing and find it out there's something wrong and then we have to terminate a pregnancy mm. that is so very wanted. Like we had to have some of those questions and they were really hard. But yeah, also because so you have important. to be aligned, right? All four of you have to be aligned on what to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Up next on the subscriber episode of this conversation, Lisa, Sarah and I go a lot deeper into some often a little bit uncomfortable territory. I ask some questions about biology, about whose eggs they're using, and why Lisa never thinks you should ask a woman the question that I ask her, and why I actually don't agree with her. Plus, what happens after Sarah gives birth in the delivery room? There is a plan for that. It's very detailed and it's fascinating. There's a link to listen to that episode in the show notes. You can click on that right now and listen straight away. I've known Lisa since we were at school together. We were in the same year at school and I'm going to become a grandmother in a few weeks around the same time she's going to become a mother for the first time. So honestly, I'm just so thrilled for her. You can follow her and Sarah's journey at Mummy at Last on Instagram. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff with sound production by Madeline Joano. I'm Mia Friedman and thanks for having me in your ears. I'll see you soon. <laughs>